Michelle. Welcome to Book Club, Hi. Gramercy Book Club. We've, um, we've had a robust conversation about your book led by uh, Margot Singer, who's done a wonderful job all about Lil and Frank and their secrets and obsessions. And we're just so thrilled to have you with us. Um, I, I want to remind our book club participants that um, we did talk a bit about your background, but you know, Jill's made an indelible mark on the world of literature with six novels prior to hieroglyphics and four collections of short stories. Her works appeared in so many lauded anthologies like the Best American Short Stories and the Norton Anthology of Short Fiction. And, um, really, she's been recognized um, uh, by many prestigious awards written for major publications, including the New York Times um, Book Review, the Washington Post, and the Atlantic. And, and, and Jill's chair the Demar Department of Creative Writing at Harvard, and she's now a faculty member of uh, the Bennington College um, Writing Seminars. Um, Jill, our moderator, Margot Singer, she's going to be asking you questions from the participants. Um, as well as her own during this portion of our book club. Everyone is now muted, so you and Margot can directly converse. And Margot, the floor is now yours. Thank you, Linda. Welcome, Jill, to Ohio. <laughs> Thank you. I know. I, I just told my sister I've got to go. I'm going to Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> the best way to come to Ohio over Zoom. It's like a, some magical trick. So welcome. I'm a Bostonian. I went to Harvard. I grew up in Boston okay. in the 60s and 70s. So I was telling everyone a little while ago that I feel like I'm one of Lil's kids. And oh, so where did many you grow up? Them, I grew up just in Natick, just west. Of, oh, my like, kids grew up. Line. My yeah. kids grew up in Wayland. Well, my parents are right on the Wayland Western <laughs> Natick line, and they still live in the big old rattling house they I grew up in. And I've been nagging them for years to downsize, et cetera. My son now lives in North Carolina. Wow. <laughs> and um, I'm really grateful in the pandemic that they did not listen to me. And they, my dad's 90 and my mom's 85 and they're still living in that old house, happily sequestered from humanity and walking in the woods. Uh, Good for better. them. I'm sure I have driven by that house many times. That's amazing. Isn't that funny? So I feel like you've been speaking to me through this book in <laughs> wonderful, wonderful ways. Um, I actually grew up on a pond called Nonsuch Pond that Thoreau um, wrote about in his journal. So it's a very, um, Boston's a very literary, um, it's in the soil. Absolutely. And the air. That's the air. So I wanted to start off, we were talking a lot about the narrative, about narrative form and structure. And uh, it's, uh, there's a place in the book where Frank remembers his grandfather saying, our job is to find pieces and put them together, each generation getting closer to the whole. And I think for all of us, one of the many pleasures of this remarkable novel for me was putting together those puzzle pieces, as I think Pat put it of memory and story in the reading of the book. The structure is so intricate with this density of image and repetition uh, that's beautifully complex. How did that structure evolve, I'm curious, over the course of drafting the novel and, and how did you make it work? It's really a high wire act, I think. Oh, th thank you so much for that. It's, it's a delight to be here. Um, I have to say that that novel for a long time looked like an enormous mess um, it was such a big mass, you know, that, that it was scary. And I mean, all writing, I think is a leap of faith. You know, we just keep going forward thinking we'll get somewhere. Um, but I knew I wanted to write a novel about memory. Mm -hmm. And so I, I wrote it organically in many ways, just, you know, bits and pieces that I thought fit into these lives, knowing that I was going to have the hardship in the future of finding the present day thread to, to hold it together. I mean, I knew that it was going to be all about a day when Frank goes in search of, you know, the boyhood home and trying to get in again. Um, but I started with, I think, Everybody except Harvey started the novel at, at one point or another. Um, I told somebody recently, I, 
I, I was asked a similar question and I said, maybe it's the Marie Kondo version of how to write a novel, except, you know, my, my favorite part is before you take all the pieces and neatly roll them and put them in the drawer. The important part of her work is that you take everything you own and throw it in a big messy heap on the bed. <laughs> and um, in many ways, I felt that's what I had done. And, um, and so I, I messed with the parts and the final arrangement really came when I was working with my editor, Kathy Pores, because uh, by that point, I wasn't seeing the repetitions as clearly as I might have, you know, uh, with fresh eyes. And so it was very helpful um, to have to have her reading it with the idea that she could help me untangle some of the uh, timeline, you know, where I got ahead of myself. And then, of course, she she insisted um, that I have dates and the place where she was, because at one point there was not, I mean, I had in my head where she was, but so that made a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those markers are, are, are helpful. So you said Harvey was a later addition? Well, he, he was there, but I never started um, the novel with him. I mean, he was always sort of under the wing of, of Shelley's introduction. Um, I love having kids on the page, so um, so I knew he was going to be there, and you know his his development required finding what he was interested in, <laughs> which of course Harvey was a lot of fun. And as I told somebody recently, I think the world can be divided um, by those of us who outgrew, who did not outgrow fifth grade humor and those who did. And I'm among the did not. <laughs> so um, it was kind of fun to give that part to Harvey. I understand from, from reading an interview that you're also a note keeper and a, a keeper of journals like Lil. Lil's held on to so many bits and scraps of paper and notes to self and unsent letters and trying to make sense of those. I mean, is, is that something drawn from, from life? Do you, do you have boxes full of bits and paper or? I, I have lots of bits of paper, um, not in any formal journal. I, I always admire those people who keep formal journals, you know, and can actually go back and look up something. Um, mine is more scattered. A lot of my notes are uh, either ideas for fiction or something I have witnessed in life um, that I don't want to forget. So I actually, now over a dozen years ago, had the good fortune um, to be asked to teach a class in Florence. And um, I always say Italy, not South Carolina. <laughs> I've, I've been there too. Um, but, but, um, so the notes about the foundling hospital, the physical description was something I had done for myself, just so I would never forget being in there. Mm -hmm. uh, and so a lot of times I have kept that kind of description or, or a memory that I end up giving to a character. Mm -hmm. I'm, I, I'm relieved to hear you're not actually a, a, diary, a organized diary keeper because I felt a little intimidated. I was like, I'm not either. Not at all. No, no. It's definitely the, the messy version of that. But I also think that, it, you know, in its organic emergence on the page enacts the, the way memory works and that kind of recursiveness and repetition, I, I felt both helps the reader navigate the nonlinear nature of the narrative. And also is, you know, that's that's the way memories circle and, and come back. Um, we have a, I, I want to come to a question from Naomi, but I just have to mention, we were talking earlier about your Instagram feed, and I was I was fascinated by some of those little collage collections oh. of objects, including the, the Foundling Hospital images. Yes, um, yes. Do you yeah. have, are those your objects? That you they are. I found my Captain Midnight badge on on um, eBay, I love and it. 
Let's see. I oh, I think the other day I did I did this. You know, I have this. <laughs> I have Harvey's mustache. Um, so I have and and this little ivory Scotty pen. He actually has kind of red eyes that I gave Lil's mother. And I don't remember, you know, this is one of those things that I found on the ground somewhere years ago. <laughs> you know, you just, I must always be looking down because I have found a lot of things on the ground. Um, so, so some of these objects I had and, and others, it was fun just to go online, even if all I did was find something and print it out, you know, like I've got all the ads for sea monkeys or darling pet monkey and all those comic book things and um just looking through old life magazines that lil's mother would have been looking at that was a lot of fun yeah that's great pat wants to know your rationale for bringing that the cj's murder from the previous novel uh into yes uh, well and thank you for that question because um when that idea occurred, as soon as I knew, I knew Shelly was going to be, her language was shorthand, right? You know, in, in all these different ways of communicating. So I knew she knew shorthand. And, you know, um, when I realized that, that I could bring back the trial, it just seemed like a great opportunity because a lot of readers were very upset with me at the end of Life After Life that I did not solve that. And uh, so um, I made that choice at the time because I, I felt it was a realistic choice. I, I think there are many people, sadly, invisible in our society who do disappear and there isn't enough done. And that's how I saw CJ. And, you know, in Life After Life, the whole point was, um, juxtaposed with people who have led long full lives so there is such a thing as a as a good death you know at the end of a long life um and and i needed that to counter balance all the many tragic and um but people were upset and so i thought well in the background uh, justice could be served. And so it was a lot of fun um, to revisit. And of course, it gave Shelley this kind of full image of um, the fear of what might have happened to her, could happen to her. Absolutely. And similarly, were the, how did the Coconut Grove fire and the Fayetteville train disaster, how did those real life events uh, find their way into the story? You know, I, I have always been, um, well, intrigued by, by both for many reasons. Um, I grew up, my hometown's just the, uh, about 20 miles from where that accident took place. And my dad was, um, you know, an adolescent and did go in the aftermath to see, to witness um, the crash site as many people did. But, but for that small community, it really, it really was a before and an after, you know, as any big disaster like that becomes. So you have the, the personal grievings of family members who have lost someone and then you have the greater grief of a whole society and what's interesting is that you know that this small North Carolina town that no one had ever heard of was on the front page of every major newspaper in our country and if you walk those tracks now there's nothing marking mm. the spot and as you know, you then, you know, and, and I would read about it and it always came to these catalog of lists of how people were identified. And these lists are real. I mean, much of what I put in the novel, those are real ways that people were identified and listed in the newspaper. And then I lived in Boston, you know, for almost 20 years. And I no sooner got there, but I realized that people referred to the Coconut Grove fire in a very similar way. Uh, the before and the after, 
the whole question of fate, all these people who almost went, then didn't. Just, just two weeks ago on the front page of the Boston Globe was an obituary for one of the last five survivors, a young tap dancer who got out and wow. lived all years. Um, but again, like, like the train site, even though this, this major, it changed so many lives, so many lives lost, it completely revamped fire codes and the way burn victims are treated. And, and yet now there's a parking deck, there's a different hotel, and it's almost hard to find the little plaque in the sidewalk. Uh, that that commemorates it. So I was just thinking a lot about time and and how if one were to ever excavate such a portion of the earth, there would be remnants of all of those lives who had been there. It's, I'm so struck by how these erasures and losses inform a book that's very much around we were talking earlier about you know the objects and the houses that are the keepers, the containers, the canopic jars, right, of, of memory. And yet, you know, you're talking about all these um, layers of, of, of erasure that, that sort of lie beneath, um, which is really moving. Um, I, I'm it's, hard, it's hard when you try to tell somebody you're trying to write a novel about what's not, what gets lost. <laughs> Yeah, right. You know, you, you are known for writing many stories, novels, you know, set in North Carolina, and this is, this is a novel set in North Carolina, but you, this time your characters are longing for Boston. And I, I wondered if that's a departure for you, if living for so many years in the Northeast has, has shifted your perspective. I mean, you're often called a Southern writer. Uh, you know. it, it really did. Um, it really did shift my perspective because um, well, first of all, I I fell in love with that place. You know how sometimes you go somewhere and you feel like you know that place, even though you've never been. And here I grew up in the South, you know, just wishing for snow, wishing for <laughs> snow, getting this much. Um, and I just, I just loved it. And I never got tired of the snow. <laughs> you know, and I was that annoying person who would still be at the grocery store all excited that the snow's coming and people are like, ah. Oh. <laughs> but, um, you know, and I think my, my children grew up there. And so what is home for your children it becomes home. So, you know, I really felt I had a foot in both camps. And, and when I moved back to North Carolina, um, there was just so much I missed, you know, and I, and I continue to. Um, it's a beautiful place and, and it's so different in terms of, um, you know, the weather that I experience. And I think and, Will's, Will's very funny in her dislike of North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, she would have no trouble these days because people can't hug her. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, what, I'm going to ask you about a short story that you wrote a while back that I, that just blew the top of my head off when I first read it, which is Intervention. Oh. Um, and for those of you who haven't read Intervention, you should, but it, like hieroglyphics, it also, uh, I mean, it's about alcoholism, it's about a lot of things, but it's also about the relationship of a long married couple and the secrets they keep from each other, from the lies they tell themselves, each other, their kids, and the ways they struggle and ultimately muddle forward and, and forgive. And it's also one of the funniest stories um, in, in their banter and the way they make fun of things behind their kids' backs. Um, how do you navigate that balance between, you know, humor and, uh, you know, the serious business of humor, as, as the famous saying goes? Yeah, you know, that, that is such a great question. I mean, I, I am such a fan of humor and I, you know, I, I love to laugh and have something that makes me laugh. And, and so I sort of keep a whole stash of things that I find funny, you know, and so like much of Harvey's 
many of his lines, you know, were things, you know, um, I mean, I, I remember my son, you know, it's like a poo-poo platter, you know, it's like things that children say and you're like, well, you're not going to make a story out of that, but it's <laughs> funny, you know, so you make a note. And, um, and, and so a lot of times I just save those scraps, not knowing whose mouth it will come out of, and yet using it as comic relief um, in the right moment. And so, so what Lil quotes as someone saying, you know, the humility has been awful lately. Um, a woman in the dry cleaning store said that to me, you yeah. know, and I mean, I'm like, oh my God, has it <laughs> ever, you know, you can't get out to your car fast enough to, to make a note. Um, so, so I, you know, the humor, it's not always there in the beginning. I mean, there are times when you know it needs a little, a little more levity. Uh, so, so it's often a kind of balance. And I think, I think really sad things and hard things can be going on in life, but people still say and do very funny things. I mean, I think we've probably all been in a in a really somber situation you know where somebody says or does something funny and it feels a little inappropriate to laugh um you know and yet we do that seems to be happening to me an awful lot lately <laughs> exactly that mix so, well there's nothing like being the only person who laughs you know which so both Naomi and Linda want to know about the title. How did you choose the title of the book? When did you choose the title of the book? Was it always hieroglyphics? You know, this uh, is a, talks to us about that. Yeah. So this is a time when it really was my idea um, from the very beginning. And at one one really miserable, difficult weekend, um, the publisher thought that I should change it because they were worried about the Google thing. And they said, because there are thousands of books about hieroglyphics, you know, but I'm like, but none of them say a novel, you know, <laughs> and, and I had just had the experience um, with Life After Life, where my book came out the same week as Kate Atkinson's Life After Life, and nobody had caught that error, you know. And I was just devastated, um, except then I, then I decided that maybe I should just think that many people bought me by mistake. <laughs> um, but anyway, so I think, you know, they knew how that was very difficult. Um, but everybody was thinking all weekend and, and nobody really came up with anything else because I even had the title before um, before the epigraph, I kind of looked, Emerson, Emerson and Thoreau both used the word, but weirdly, it's, it's not used that much, you know, yeah. and, um, and so that was, that was kind of exciting to discover because I wanted it to be as the Sandberg poem talks about, you know, what, what actually gets lost. And so I was thinking of the actual physical languages, um, everything from, you know, Harvey's Klingon. I have a Klingon decoder ring too. <laughs> um, you know, and shorthand and cursive and, and then also thinking about those objects that actually say something, tell stories. Ballet is a story without words. Um, you know, so uh, all those little tokens in the foundling hospital are, are say, you know, somebody left it and it means I'll be back. But you know, by way of it being there, we know the end, or at least we know what did not happen in that person's life. And, and so I was just fascinated because that's, that's what we all, that's, that's what we are at the end of the day, I think, you know, what we have given access to um, others by way of our words and our 
letters and our stories, um, but also the objects surrounding us. And I mean, I, I don't know about all of you. I would suspect we all have little things that nobody would know why we kept it <laughs> if, we, if we didn't say so. And I find that pretty, um, well, it, it's what makes us all unique and worthy of a, worthy of a life story. That's beautifully said. This was a book that, and there aren't many, I read all the time, but this was a book that truly touched my heart. And I, I just, I was telling everyone, I want to read it again and again because of its complexity um, and, and depth. So thank you so much. Thank you, Margo. Thank you for the wonderful questions. I'm going to come so I can see everybody. <laughs> I'm going to hand back to Linda. And um, I just want to thank Jill and, and all of you for, for making my evening. Uh, this, this is a a challenging moment for us in higher education and we're on zoom all day and, and this was is truly the highlight of, of my uh, of my month. <laughs> so, oh, thank uh, you. So much. <laughs> I, I mean, it's a pleasure for me. You know, I really I, I have found that I do these things and I really do feel like I, I have been somewhere. <laughs> so tonight I've been in Ohio and I'm I would look I look forward to crossing paths in person someday it's um but it sure puts in perspective uh i told somebody the other day wouldn't you love just that normal kind of annoyance you have like when someone hogs um the armrest in the movie theater when it's so crowded <laughs> or, yeah. or you know bumping into you in a on a crowded sidewalk um that's you know, maybe we won't complain quite as much <laughs> next time. But. Well, Jill, thank you. I want to add uh, to Margo um, our, my, our, our deepest thanks from Gramercy Books. Um, and and Margo, I'm I'm you know we're we're very grateful also to um, your wonderful moderating of this program, and also to Maddie Shepard who has been our back end manager and does such a wonderful job um, with all our Zoom events, and to all of you uh, participating in, in tonight's discussion of just an extraordinary novel.